Prologue. A group of tourists had stopped to gawp at Millie as she stood in her wedding dress on the registry office steps. They clogged up the pavement opposite while Oxford shoppers, accustomed to the yearly influx, stepped round them into the road, not even bothering to complain. A few glanced up towards the steps of the registry office to see what all the fuss was about, and tacitly acknowledged that the young couple on the steps did make a very striking pair. One or two of the tourists had even brought out cameras, and Millie beamed joyously at them, reveling in their attention, trying to imagine the picture she and Alan made together. Her spiky white blonde hair was growing hot in the afternoon sun, the hired veil was scratchy against her neck, the nylon lace of her dress felt uncomfortably damp wherever it touched her body, but still she felt light-hearted and full of a euphoric energy, and whenever she glanced up at Alan, at her husband, a new hot thrill of excitement coursed through her body, obliterating all other sensation. She had only arrived in Oxford three weeks ago. School had finished in July, and while all her friends had planned trips to Ibiza and Spain and Amsterdam, Millie had been packed off to a secretarial college in Oxford. Much more useful than some silly holiday, her mother had announced firmly. And just think of what an advantage you'll have over the others when it comes to job hunting. But Millie didn't want an advantage over the others. She wanted a suntan and a boyfriend, and beyond that she didn't really care. So, on the second day of the typing course, she'd slipped off after lunch. She found a cheap hairdresser, and with a surge of exhilaration, told him to chop her hair short and bleach it. Then, feeling light and happy, she'd wandered around the dry, sun-drenched streets of Oxford, dipping into cool cloisters and chapels, peering behind stone arches, wondering where she might sunbathe. It was a pure coincidence that she'd eventually chosen a patch of lawn in Corpus Christi College, that Rupert's room should have been directly opposite, that he and Alan should have decided to spend that afternoon doing nothing but lying on the grass drinking pims. She'd watched surreptitiously as they sauntered onto the lawn, clinked glasses and lit up cigarettes, gazed harder as one of them took off his shirt to reveal a tanned torso. She'd listened to the snatches of their conversation which wafted through the air towards her, and found herself longing to know these debonair, good-looking men. When suddenly the older one addressed her, she felt her heart leap with excitement. Have you got a light? His voice was dry, American, amused. Yes, she stuttered, feeling in her pocket. Yes, I have. We're terribly lazy, I'm afraid. The younger man's eyes met hers. Shire, more diffident. I've got a lighter just inside that window. He pointed to a stone mullioned arch, but it's too hot to move. We'll repay you with a glass of pims, said the American. He'd held out his hand. Alan. Rupert. She'd lolled on the grass with them for the rest of the afternoon, soaking up the sun and alcohol, flirting and giggling, making them both laugh with her descriptions of her fellow secretaries. At the pit of her stomach was a feeling of anticipation which increased as the afternoon wore on, a sexual frisson heightened by the fact that there were two of them and they were both beautiful. Rupert was lithe and golden like a young lion, his hair a shining blonde halo, his teeth gleaming white against his smooth brown face. Alan's face was crinkled and his hair was graying at the temples, but his grey-green eyes made her heart jump when they met hers, and his voice caressed her ears like silk. When Rupert rolled over onto his back and said to the sky, Shall we go for something to eat tonight? She'd thought he must be asking her out. An immediate, unbelieving joy had coursed through her. Simultaneously, she'd recognized that she would have preferred if it had been Alan. But then Alan rolled over too and said, Sure thing. And then he leaned over and casually kissed Rupert on the mouth. The strange thing was, after the initial heart-stopping shock, Millie hadn't really minded. In fact, this way was almost better. This way, she had the pair of them to herself. She'd gone to San Antonio's with them that night and basked in the jealous glances of two fellow secretaries at another table. 
The next night, they'd played jazz on an old wind-up gramophone and drunk mint juleps and taught her how to roll joints. Within a week, they'd become a regular threesome. And then Alan had asked her to marry him. Immediately, without thinking, she'd said yes. He'd laughed, assuming she was joking, and started on a lengthy explanation of his plight. He'd spoken of visas, of home office officials, of outdated systems and discrimination against gays. All the while, he'd gazed at her entreatingly, as though she still needed to be won over. But Millie was already won over, was already pulsing with excitement at the thought of dressing up in a wedding dress, holding a bouquet, doing something more exciting than she'd ever done in her life. It was only when Alan said, half-frowning, I can't believe I'm actually asking someone to break the law for me, that she realized quite what was going on. But the tiny qualms which began to prick her mind were no match for the exhilaration pounding through her as Alan put his arm around her and said quietly into her ear, You're an angel. Millie had smiled breathlessly back and said, It's nothing, and truly meant it. And now they were married. They'd hurtled through the vows, Alan in a dry, surprisingly serious voice, Millie quavering on the brink of giggles. Then they'd signed the register, Alan first, his hand quick and deft, then Millie attempting to produce a grown-up signature for the occasion. And then, almost to Millie's surprise, it was done, and they were husband and wife. Alan had given Millie a tiny grin and kissed her again, her mouth still tingled slightly from the touch of him. Her wedding finger still felt self-conscious in its gold-plated ring. That's enough pictures, said Alan suddenly. We don't want to be too conspicuous. Just a couple more, said Millie quickly. It had been almost impossible to persuade Alan and Rupert that she should hire a wedding dress for the occasion. Now she was wearing it, she wanted to prolong the moment forever. She moved slightly closer to Alan, clinging to his elbow, feeling the roughness of his suit against her bare arm. A sharp summer breeze had begun to ripple through her hair, tugging at her veil and cooling the back of her neck. An old theater program was being blown along the dry, empty gutter. On the other side of the street, the tourists were starting to melt away. Rupert, called Alan, that's enough snapping. Wait, said Millie desperately, what about the confetti? Well, okay, said Alan indulgently. I guess we can't forget Millie's confetti.